Good evening, and welcome to this quarterly webcast of the <coughs> Methodist Debate Cardiovascular Journal. I'm Miguel Quinones, the editor-in-chief of the journal. And uh, today we're going to discuss the topic of the current issue of the journal, which is the um, role of the kidneys in uh, heart disease, particularly heart failure. And as you all know, the kidney and the heart are in a joint partnership for life. And when one organ has a problem, it affects the other one and vice versa. And as cardiologists, we, we feel we are experts in the heart, but we often are not completely updated on the importance of the kidney and what's going on uh, in terms of research and development. So we felt that it was important to have an issue of the journal dedicated to this topic that is so relevant in our day-to-day -day practice. And I'm indebted to the um, editor, the guest editor for this particular issue, Dr. Hassam Ibrahim, who is on my left. Uh, he's professor of surgery and the director of the transplant nephrology at the McGovern Medical School, University of Texas here in Houston. And he really did a, ma did a magnificent job putting topics together and getting expert writers to uh, write the uh, review articles. So today we're going to try to cover uh, a fair amount of those topics by having authors here that are going to uh, answer some questions and we're going to try to do it as a dialogue. And without any further delay, I put it in the hands of Dr. Ibrahim. And well, thank you for being here. Well, thank you very much. Well, uh, certainly uh, cardiovascular disease continues to be the number one cause of death in the setting of chronic kidney disease. And while that risk gets alleviated dramatically with kidney transplantation, cardiovascular disease continues to be the number one cause of people dying with kidney function. Conversely, kidney uh, derangements occur commonly in the setting of heart failure, and there are multiple diseases that affect both the kidney and the heart. And with the expanding indications for heart and lung transplantation, uh, there's a quite a few people who actually end up developing kidney disease. The goal of this issue is to kind of take it from uh, the, for the entire spectrum of how the kidney interacts with the heart in states of health and also in states of disease. And our first topic is uh, a commonly debated one, and which is uh, the connection between the heart and the kidney in the setting of acute decompensated heart failure. And our uh, guest author for this section is uh, Dr. Alvaro Tomayo Gutierrez, who's a nephrologist and who trained with us. And uh, we'll start with, with him uh, by perhaps uh, just giving us a 30 seconds uh, <laughs> overview of uh, what he thinks in, uh, was going on in this area of research. Sure, thank you. Um, so that what we try to do in this paper is to highlight uh, the importance of venous congestion in heart failure. Um, we, we try to emphasize that venous congestion by itself without a reduce on the left ventricular function can cause AKI or CKD, uh, meaning kidney dysfunction. Um, we, we have researched uh, the literature up to the uh, 100 years ago that this was being discussed. And there's a clear mechanism established by which venous congestion leads to kidney impairment, even in the presence of preserved left ventricular function. Thank you for that brief introduction. Could you tell us why does GFR go down uh, even if the ejection fraction is normal? Because most people would think it's the reduction in cardiac output with resultant decrease in renal blood flow is what causes the GFR to go down. So why does it go down if your cardiac output is uh, maintained? Yes, so that, that's uh, one of the most important parts of the paper is there's mainly two mechanisms by which this happens. Uh, it all uh, centers in the fact that the renal vein uh, gets an increased pressure. When you have an increased pressure in the renal vein, it gets transmitted 
all the way to the intraglomerular pressure. So it opposes ultrafiltration. Um, in this issue of the paper, we show that there's many uh, animal models that can prove that. And that's one way of opposing ultrafiltration by increasing intraglomerular pressure that gets transmitted from the increased renal blood pressure. The other mechanism by which this happens is a decrease in the arterial venous gradient. Uh, to have blood flow in any organ, you need a gradient that goes from higher pressure to lower pressure. Uh, what happens when the, there's an increase in the renal vein pressure, you have a decreased gradient, and therefore you also have a decreased perfusion to the kidney, even with a preserved cardiac index. Thank you. What, what would you say uh, cardiologists and nephrologists, I think, have differing opinions or uh, sometimes similar opinions? What would you say uh, are the most effective strategies for venous decongestion? If you were to rank them most effective to least effective, what would you say uh, the rank order is? Yes, so I, I would still keep loop diuretics as the first choice. Um, then they, we will have thiazide diuretics. Um, ultrafiltration has a role for some selected patients, especially patients that are undergoing a heart transplantation and they have already seek advanced CKD. Um, they can benefit from ultrafiltration. Uh, but the, the main therapy keeps being loop diuretics with the addition maybe of thiazide diuretics. And how would you prefer these be used? Intermittent boluses, constant infusion, oral? What, what do you think the data supports the most? Yes, so we also try to emphasize in this paper that uh, a more expensive intervention doesn't always relate into better clinical outcomes. Um, intermittent boluses versus continuous infusion of blood diuretics are equivalent. Maybe the, the infusion has better hemodynamic control, but they're mainly uh, equivalent. As far as adding albumin to the loop diuretics, uh, this was derived from a rat model in which uh, they saw an increase in sodium excretion in rats the, the theory behind that is that uh, loop diuretics are bound with albumin. So a lot of these patients, they also have hypoalbuminemia. <clears throat> the theory is that uh, if you give more albumin, you can form the complexes. However, this so far has not been proved by evidence. Uh, there's multiple trials uh, investigating this, and they haven't found a significant difference between using loop diuretics alone versus using loop diuretics with albumin. What would you caution people about uh, the combined use of albumin and diuretics together? What is, what is the, the detriment in doing that? Yes, so first, uh, I always like to think about the financial cost. It's going to increase your cost with an intervention that has, does not translate into clinical benefit. Second, albumin is also compound with sodium. So if you're trying to diurese a patient and you're giving them extra sodium, that's definitely gonna cause some more water retention that you're gonna try to prevent. Um, and thirdly, albumin itself uh, exerts some oncotic pressure, which can also be detrimental for the patient. Yeah, I think your last point is very critical. I, I don't think people realize this, but each gram of albumin you give pulls 20 cc's of fluid from the interstitium to the intravascular space. So when you give 50 grams, you're going to move 1,000 a, a ml in the in intravascular space. Uh, so one has to be uh, extra careful. I'm sure you're aware of this. Uh, the New England Journal of Medicine two weeks ago published this trial, which uh, I think we've been wanting to do for years, uh, using carbonic anhydrase inhibitors uh, as uh, a way to decongest the heart. Could you comment on the rationale behind doing this and what your impression of the trial is? Sure. Um, so, acetazolamide and carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, uh, they can counteract the metabolic alkalosis that can be induced with diuresis. Um, the theory would be 
that when you reach a certain pH, you cannot diurese anymore because of the pH. And you can also cause hypoventilation if the patient has other comorbidities that can increase the metabolic alkalosis, such as COPD or liver cirrhosis. Um, so it would be beneficial if you reduce the pH so you avoid hypoventilation. Um, as a diuretic itself and a diuretic enhancer, I still think uh, more evidence needs to support that. Uh, but there's certainly uh, a role for carbonic anhydrase inhibitors in the future. Yeah, thank you. And I think the bigger point, I mean, the, the bi biology of these agents is that in the setting of heart failure, uh, instead of 60% of sodium being reabsorbed in the proximal tubule, that fraction goes up to 90%. So some of the loss of efficacy of loop diuretics, because there's no sodium going to the loop of Henle, so there's no substrate. So inhibiting <clears throat> uh, the sodium reabsorption proximally, I think, is a, is a very uh, novel strategy. Uh, thank you so much. It's a beautiful article, and hopefully uh, it will help people think about uh, venous congestion in, in a fresh way because you've spent a lot of time looking at the data dating back to the 1930s. So thank you very much. Well, one thing I just wanted to add, uh, uh, San um, and uh, Dr. Tomayo, is that, you know, uh, at least as far as the venous congestion is concerned, there are at least a couple of devices, you know, uh, which are now entering clinical trials. Now, as you know, everyone knows, you know, diuretic resistance is real. And as much as we would like to, you know, use diuretics and there are strategies to improve uh, the resistance, it's, it's still real. So there are two trials, one of which is a temporary SVC occlusion device. Uh, we are doing the trial where uh, it's almost like a balloon pump, but it's in the SVC. Uh, but it, it temporarily occludes it um, uh, periodically. And uh, another one, <clears throat> which is again, sort of uh, being used for cardiorenal syndrome, where it probably is going to increase the perfusion pressure by, by increasing the flow is aortic. So there are a few, uh, you know, devices coming into this, uh, in, into this realm in, in treating cardiorenal syndrome. So I think the future, uh, it, it, we are going to, be seeing a lot more um, uh, technologies as well as you know different medications like the cetazolamide in, in, in this area. I would like to um, uh, remind the, our audience that if you have any questions that you can submit them uh, by texting DeBakey to 37607. And in fact, we have a couple of questions that have come in, one very quick response. Would low blood pressure by itself lead to renal failure? I would be one that some, someone has, is asking us to, who wants to, you want to take that quickly? Well, low blood pressure certainly can cause kidney failure, especially uh, the kidney has an auto-regulatory mechanism where uh, as long as the systolic blood pressure between 80 and 200, uh, the kidney will auto-regulate to maintain renal blood flow. Anything less than 80, you actually lose the, lose the exactly. auto-regulation and lose renal blood flow. Certainly, you know, I, I mean, we think, you know, time or period of 30 minutes or more is needed for that to happen because tubular cells are quite resistant, but hypotension certainly can cause uh, uh, acute kidney injury, particularly if the cause of the hypotension uh, has a, a grave cause such as sepsis or acute myocardial infarction or systemic illness that's driving the low blood pressure. Another question that I know, Dr. Um, Alvaro, you cover in your paper because I read it, is would renal failure lead to heart failure? Quick response on that one. Yes, the answer is absolutely yes. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> There's several mechanisms by which that can happen, so yes. Yes. I have a question that, that it's, again, another point that frequently cardiologists and nephrologists are, are arguing about. That we love to use spironolactone in managing heart failure. And we find ourselves sometimes that the patient get, goes to see the nephrologist and they stop the spironolactone. Other than hyperkalemia, which is very obvious, uh, is there any situations that you feel uncomfortable uh, with a patient being on spironolactone if they have, a, let's say, a GFR of 30? Not really, unless there's a metabolic alkalosis component, but I, I wouldn't... Uh, like you said, hyperkalemia would be the other one, but uh, I wouldn't have any more reservations. 
and I, I guess you and I were talking about that earlier, and you feel the same way that you normally. Well, I you, think, I mean, uh, comfortable uh, with the patient. I mean, the reality is, I think uh, they're effective drugs, but we don't have data uh, that they're effective in people with GFRs less than 30. Uh, so I think that's been shown in people with preserved kidney function, but uh, certainly aldosterone antagonism is now becoming mainstay of therapy and slowing the progression of kidney disease. So I think it's a win-win situation as long as uh, there's no hyperkalemia. Certainly, uh, there's newer agents now that has a more favorable side effect profile and they're available and they have FD indications for diabetic kidney disease. Yep. Which I think, you know, the question whether kidney failure lead to heart failure takes us to, to the next part and Dr. Ahsan uh, is with us and uh, he wrote uh, uh, the, the piece or the editorial on heart failure and transplant. Could you please tell us what are the indications for uh, combined heart kidney transplant? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Canones and Dr. Ibrahim for the invitation to speak tonight on behalf of Dr. Bimraj, who is my senior author on this paper. And the simple answer is the indications for combined transplant come down to identifying patients who are most likely to benefit from transplanting two organs versus single. You know, solitary heart or kidney transplant is really the definitive therapy for end-stage disease and improved survival, quality of life. But because of the complex interplay of the kidneys and the heart, concurrent dysfunction in both systems is highly prevalent. And so combined heart and kidney transplant is a means of definitively treating uh, dysfunction concurrently in both organs and is actually growing rapidly across the United States. So what we tried to do is to simplify the decision making with our algorithm in the paper um, about how to select the right patients for dual organ transplant. Really it comes down to in patients who have end stage heart failure and renal dysfunction the first step in our algorithm excuse me, should be optimizing hemodynamics, either with mechanical circulatory support or inotropes to try and increase flow to the kidneys. Then if the patients have dialysis, are on dialysis or have severe chronic kidney disease, you know, the EGFR is less than 30, it's clear that these patients would benefit from transplanting both organs and they should be considered for heart kidney <coughs> transplant. Conversely, you know, patients with an EGFR that improves to over 45 are really unlikely to derive benefit from transplanting the kidney as well. And so these patients should only be considered for heart transplant. There's a little bit of nuance in the gray zone of patients with an EGFR of 30 to 45. You know, in these patients, we should delve a little bit further, try and figure out if they have imaging or lab findings of renal disease such as small or atrophic kidneys, um, large proteinuria. And these patients should be monitored serially for worsening uh, renal function or renal replacement therapy. If that becomes the case, then we know that by giving these patients uh, kidney transplant along with heart transplant, we can reduce the risk of dialysis and improve graft outcomes. Uh, on the other hand, if after our therapy, the kidneys either appear healthy or the EGFR recovers, then heart transplant alone would be sufficient in these patients uh, with obviously careful monitoring of the GFR and kidney function post operative One were to get both organs and one rejects the heart, how likely it is or what is the concordance rate that if you reject the heart, you're rejecting the kidney and vice versa? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. And, and it really is great because it sort of touches on the immunologic difference between a dual and single organ transplant. So, you know, analysis of uh, UNOS or United Network of Organ Sharing data shows that heart and kidney acute rejection rates in combined transplant are as low as half of those of single organ recipients. And in fact, kidney graft rejection is so low that in numerous single center studies, they actually don't report any kidney graft rejection uh, events in their cohort. So what this means is in the modern era, we actively, you know, there's active surveillance for cardiac rejection with protocol biopsies. And if cardiac rejection is found, we treat these patients uh, with high dose immunosuppression 
for uh, the cardiac rejection event, and we actually don't go looking necessarily for kidney rejection. Uh, in fact, we have uh, kidney rejection surveillance is now transitioning towards non-invasive uh, studies, gene expression profiling, cell-free DNA, and in patients who have dual organs, if we do do these non-invasive surveillance methods and we, we are suspect rejection in the recipient, again, we biopsy the heart and don't necessarily go looking for kidney rejection. So because truthfully, my answer to your question is that I can't tell you the, the rates of concordant rejection because we normally don't go looking in because the rates are so very low. Yeah, and it's it also possible you just use so much calcineurin inhibitor at higher levels that the, the kidney may not reject. Which brings me to, to the next uh, point. Uh, wh what do you make of a patient who's a heart transplant and with a high creatinine two and a half, three, two years after transplant, what are the kind of the natural uh, thought process do you go through to try to sort out why the creatinine is uh, going up? Do you mean in a heart transplant alone or a dual or a uh, heart transplant alone? Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's a number of reasons for it and chief among them would be calcineurin uh, inhibitor toxicity. You know, a mainstay of, or if not toxicity, then uh, renal dysfunction induced because of it. A mainstay of uh, heart transplant immunosuppression is the use of CNIs. And heart transplant recipients generally require higher levels of immunosuppression than almost any other solid organ. So it's not unexpected that after the initial insult of the transplant procedure, long-term use of these therapies, uh, you know, as well as hemodynamic shifts associated with the rejection events, that's where we would look at as a as a primary culprit, uh, assuming the patient is otherwise stable. So that's when we consider what alternative regimens we can use or minimizing calcineurin inhibitors to try and reduce the long-term toxicity or progression of renal disease. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, I think this is, I'm trying to put you on the spot here, but uh, I mean, I think this is where we're going wrong. Uh, I think everybody's blaming these drugs for nephrotoxicity, while in fact, there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever uh, that they cause any his distinct histological changes. They, they do lower your GFR, but you take them away and it gets better. And I think we learned that in the kidney transplant, you, you minimize CNIs, you avoid CNIs, and all you see is more acute rejection. Uh, and certainly, I think the heart and lung is still uh, focused on, on this idea. And uh, without actually doing biopsies, it's really hard to know. But uh, that is, you reflect the usual sentiment because it's easy to just blame it on these drugs and because we don't do biopsies, but uh, certainly uh, that's the one thing we, we, we go after. Uh, well, thank you uh, so much. I don't know if anybody on the panel want to ask our heart kidney transplant expert any questions. All right, well, thank I you very much. I think much. I just want to add, ahead, add a point, uh, uh, Hassan, is that I mean, as much as, uh, you know, you allude to, you know, us doing kidney biopsies um, uh, to, I guess, look for CNI toxicity related changes. I think oftentimes when we look at it for, you know, at, at three or four years, you know, CAD is kind of out of the bag, right? So, and at least in, kid, uh, at least in heart transplantation in randomized control trials with mTOR inhibition, which has started reasonably early there is data that you know your gfr does um, get better or at least does not get any worse compared to continuation of cni so that is uh, you know i guess um, you can extrapolate from that that probably cnis are contributing to some amount of ongoing cni toxicity but you're right that, you know, in, when you look at it in a patient level, there is no way of knowing. But, you know, that that's where we get get the data that probably CNI, you know, toxicity is contributing some to. Uh, that's an excellent point. The analogy to this, I mean, ACE inhibitors lower GFR, but you take them away, the GFR goes up. 
so CNI, you just take them away, the GFR goes up. So, uh, but I think uh, there's uh, some comfort we have when we stop them and the creatinine gets better, but uh, it's really not altering structure. But uh, we could debate this. That should have been uh, one of the articles, <laughs> which kind of moves me <coughs> to you, sir, because uh, tell, what is your sense for the renal dysfunction in patients with LVADs? Is it the same physiology as uh, somebody with heart failure without an LVAD? Is, is the renal uh, changes or hemodynamic alterations different or are they, they follow the same theme? They do follow the same theme to a certain extent because except for the fact that, you know, you do have continuous flow, right? Now, most of the LVADs uh, are continuous flow devices. I mean, all of them are continuous flow devices. Currently, we just have essentially one which is approved and we use, uh, which is uh, HeartMate 3 uh, uh, made by Abbott, and it's a continuous flow device. And almost, you know, 70, 80 percent of our patients do not have uh, a pulse which is consistent and present all the time. So most of our patients are non-pulsatile, and we know that a non-pulsatility adds to endothelial dysfunction, right, which... Uh, um, it does add to some amount of microvascular uh, injury or damage. And uh, uh, so that is an additive factor to, you know, uh, to renal dysfunction in patients with LVAD. In addition to, you know, venous congestion, which we do see in LVAD patients, because over time, you know, cardiomyopathy, which involves both ventricles, you know, um, over time, since only one ventricle is supported, patients do have varying degrees of right heart failure, and that definitely contributes to venous congestion. And uh, uh, as alluded to by Dr. Tamayo, you know, uh, worsening renal uh, failure. How do you judge uh, kidney function in patients with an LVAD? They're sarcopenic, have no muscle mass, they're <laughs> deconditioned, their nutritional status almost universally not the greatest. So how, how do you make sense of the creatinine of 1.5? Because somebody might argue this is advanced GFR reduction. What, what, what do you think we should be measuring? No, I, I, I completely agree that I think sarcopenia plays a big role. And uh, I mean, at least here we do, you know, I guess use other measures, including cystatin C and 24-hour uh, creatinine clearance, which I think does uh, help a little bit uh, with, with regard to that, but y you're very right that I think uh, sarcopenia uh, plays a big role. And that's one of the things which, uh, you know, uh, is a problem with some of the studies, right? So usually within six to 12 months, patients do end up, you know, getting a lot of their, at least the younger patients do end up getting some of their uh, muzzle back so and when the creatinine you know either stays the same or goes up is it just because they you know uh now they are less sarcopenic compared to when they went into an LVAD, you know and that that's something that we really don't take into account so when there are while there are studies showing that you know there is some improvement of creatinine immediately post-op and maybe a plateauing or worsening but they don't really take into account the the gain in muscle mass or or lack thereof. Uh, one last uh, question: How does the allocation system for somebody with an LVAD who needs a kidney? Do they get priority? Is it uh, they go in the queue like everyone else? How does that work? Uh, it does. I mean, it's, unfortunately, right? It, it, they go into the queue just like anybody else, and. Uh, it's a problem because uh, patients with LVAD and especially those who develop dialysis dependence after an LVAD surgery, they are at a particular disadvantage because of very few dialysis centers, you know, being capable of doing dialysis. And the challenges of doing dialysis is somebody who is continuous flow with low blood pressure uh, and, you know, worsening uh, RV failure it's it's challenging and you know once that uh, sort of cycle sets in a lot of them end up needing inotropes for rv support you know think about this you know somebody who is 
already has an LVAD, now needs an inotrope and needs dialysis. That's okay. And if they have to wait in the same line as everybody else to get a heart kidney, it's just almost, you know. It's, it's, if an LVAD patient needs dialysis, what, what do you recommend we should use for access? Fistula, a catheter? Uh, is there, how do, you, how, do, how do you, I mean, because that's a, that's a big issue. I mean, do you really want It wanna, is a big issue, yes. What, what's absolutely. your preference? Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, our practice has evolved. So we used to prefer using um, uh, temporary access, especially in those bridge to transplant patients, because we felt, you know, we could get them to transplant soon, soon enough. And also, we were worried about whether these fistulas will mature, one. And secondly, whether the excess venous load, you know, the, 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 the fistula is going to cause to the RV, will the RV be able to tolerate that? So I think this needs to be really decided patient to patient because, you know, you have to factor in their right ventricular function, you know, and whether uh, <clears throat> that's going to be able to tolerate that and whether uh, based on their blood group and their body size, whether they're going to be transplantable anytime soon. And this is a, maybe a silly question. Is peritoneal dialysis contraindicated in patients with LVAD? Uh, I would be very nervous, but... <laughs> Are you aware of any data or anybody used it or...? No, I mean, we had a patient with peritoneal dialysis who underwent an LVAD and we switched him to HD because we just could not, you know, I guess uh, we were worried about the risk of driveline infection and or, you know, this was, of course, in the era of HeartMate 2, which was, uh, uh, you know, uh, peritoneal device, if you will, or, you know, or infradiaphragmatic device. So, great. but... Well uh, yeah, I think we would we would want them to switch to HD. Well, thank you very much. That was uh, wonderful. Uh, we will thank move uh, to next topic, which is how should one manage hypertension in the setting of chronic uh, kidney disease? Uh, certainly, the blood pressure targets have evolved, have changed. Which agents we should use has really uh, been changed. So, Dr. Hebert, uh, what do you think is the goal, a blood pressure goal in kidney transplant recipients? And uh, I would like you to also tell me how you feel about lung transplant recipients, uh, heart transplant recipients. What kind of blood pressure target uh, should these organ transplant recipients have? We'll start with the kidney. So the kidney, so actually kind of starting with individuals with chronic kidney disease, we want to actually push for lower, less than 120 over 80. Um, and uh, kidney transplant recipients are different than, than the rest of the, the group of individuals with chronic kidney disease. And that has to do with the, the fact, as you alluded to before, with the loss of autoregulation. So these kidneys that are placed into individuals don't have the sympathetic innervation to be able to correct for uh, or prevent from, from hypotensive episodes. So the, the goal for kidney transplant recipients is really less than 130 over 80. Um, that's where the max cardiac benefit is gonna be and, and we don't have the risk associated with hypotension and um, with uh, you know, ER admissions that, that were present in uh, the SPRINT trial in a, in a small portion of those who were intensively controlled. And is, is this home blood pressure? Is it office? Is it ambulatory? I, mean, I think one of the highlights of SPRINT trial that a lot of individuals think about is, wow, 120 over 80 is better. But let's put that into context. The first thing is that they had a very strict protocol on how they manage the blood pressures. So this isn't just you go to the clinic office, you have a blood pressure measurement and your blood pressure is high, we need to reduce it immediately. This is a protocol where we have individuals that are unobserved uh, for after more than five minutes of rest. They have repeat measurements. They average the measurements out over a course of three. So, so we really have to be cautious with just treating people to an intensive arm of less than 120 over 80. I think a great strategy is to use home blood pressure monitoring where individuals can 
check their blood pressure at home. And we can use that as a way of defining what their blood pressures are at home in the context of also what their clinic blood pressures are. A great thing that we should be implementing in all of our CKD patients is something called a 24 hour ambulatory blood pressure monitor where we're able to see the diurnal pattern and we're able to determine what, what is our load of elevated blood pressures as well as where is our max efficacy with the, the antihypertensives that we're using. Should we use these agents in the morning? Should we use these agents at nighttime? And what is the, the overall impact that we're gonna be able to have on individualizing care? So I think that's really where we're going is more towards individualization of care. While we have more agreement on the blood pressure goals, we really need to focus on individualizing care for that particular person, whether they be a kidney transplant recipient or an individual with chronic kidney disease. So Dr. Ebert, I'll give you uh, an example, a 45-year-old kidney transplant recipient or somebody with IgA nephropathy checks his blood pressure at home uh, and it's elevated and they come to your clinic and their blood pressure is 120 over 80, consistently elevated at home but normal in the office. Uh, could you tell us what, what, what that phenomena is and how people think about it now? Because mostly yeah. they would say, oh, your machine must be wrong at home and the office machine is more accurate. Could you tell us what that's called and how actually uh, is really transforming how we think about hypertension? I think that's so critical is because sometimes we get reassured by clinic blood pressures being normal when in fact what you're alluding to is something called masked hypertension where an individual's blood pressures are completely normal when they're uh, in the clinic but at home their blood pressures are sky high and that's actually more concerning because we have very uncontrolled hypertension for longer periods of time. Um, and that's where the benefit of 24 hour ambulatory blood pressure monitor will really help us in individualizing care. Um, it, it really, I think it's key to know that individuals with chronic kidney disease, we do need to screen for either home blood pressures or ambulatory blood pressure monitors because there's such a high prevalence of mass hypertension. And if we don't screen for this, then we're gonna run into problems in, in treating them overall. But ambulatory blood pressure is very expensive, I was told. Yeah. Not necessarily. You can actually, we can, depends on what type of blood pressure monitor you use, but there are a lot more affordable ways of, of doing this. Um, and if there is a concern for cost, then there's really a great compromise where if we were to take a blood pressure uh, reading at home for a course of two weeks, you could do it twice a day for two weeks, that has a pretty good correlation with a 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitor. The, yeah, the and issue I think, that Yeah, the point I was trying to make, they're, act they're actually not expensive. Uh, I mean, it is really sad that major academic centers take some, you know, three months yeah. to get an ambulatory blood pressure monitor. You could buy them, you could buy a hundred of them online. They're calibrated and they cost no money whatsoever. So that notion they're expensive needs to change and people need to uh, kind of change how they think about it. You mentioned home blood pressure. What machine should people buy? What kind of machine? Is there a brand they should get? So there's always a brand that you can get uh, at your local pharmacy. And I think the most important thing is making sure that if you have an oscillometric device that um, you're able to have that calibrated regularly. They have to be calibrated on the order of every year. So make sure that they're calibrated appropriately. And, and, and these devices are not cost prohibitive. You can go to uh, whatever pharmacy, retail pharmacy you, you go to and, and find these these blood pressure devices. Yeah, this is not a plug for the company that makes it, but the only uh, home blood pressure monitor that's been validated in Sprint was the Omron, O-M-R-O-N. So that's the one, and they're available, and, uh, but that's the one that turns out to be what, validated. What, one practical question. Um, in the absence of ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, 
um, given that blood pressure is never 100% flat, it is ups and down depending on stresses and everything else that patients face. I have used a simple rule of the 80% the, the rule. In other words, if I ask them to do two weeks twice a day and 80% of the readings are in target, I'll ignore the other 20%. I just made that up because I had to figure out what to do. It's almost impossible to get a 100% um, uh, you know, success because life is life and they're not always going to be totally relaxed. I wonder how, how you do it in your practice. I mean, do you demand 100% of the readings to be on that target, or do you have a little flexibility? What I actually do is I average all yeah. of the readings. So you have 28 readings, you can average those, sure. and what the goal should be is, is at least less than 130, ideally less than 120 over 80 in those with chronic kidney disease. So, Dr. Abair, one last question. So, what is the ideal agents for patients with native kidney disease, uh, patients with kidney transplant, and I'll throw a heart transplant patients who are hypertensive? So, the one, the one group that we should really be targeting is going to be the renin angiotensin system. Um, so, ACE and ARBs are going to be probably the first line agent that we should be utilizing. Um, in the immediate post-operative period for kidney transplant recipients, a lot of times we will use dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. And that really has to do with the, the fact that we're waiting for their kidney function to, to get down to their baseline and concerns for hyperkalemia that may happen in the immediate post-operative period. Well, thank you very much. I think uh, this, this is a good uh, transition uh, to Perhaps the most revolutionary drugs that we've had in the last five, 10 years is uh, SGLT2 uh, inhibitors. And we're lucky to have Dr. Cancera with us today. And uh, could you please tell us, uh, they're certainly popular. There's a lot of interest in them. More payers are paying for them. Uh, they're certainly on TV all the time. <laughs> Uh, who's a good candidate for these agents? So you have a type one, type two diabetic uh, who's virgin to medications. Is that somebody who should go on these or should go on something else? Then you add them. Could you tell us uh, what you recommend? Absolutely, yes. I think this is a very interesting question and I often get this asked this question several times. Uh, as, you, as you see uh, from the article, what we try to highlight was what are the salient, very promising aspects of uh, this class of agents. And they have some very promising outcomes on uh, some renal outcomes, heart failure outcomes, and uh, cardiovascular outcomes. So if there is an individual who has some of these pre-existing diseases, yes, they are absolutely wonderful agents to add. Um, what we don't have much evidence about is uh, primary prevention. So if somebody who does not have any of these risk factors or uh, pre-existing comorbid conditions, uh, would we achieve uh, the similar benefits? That's our presumption, but yes, there is no evidence for it. Uh, a lucrative uh, profile of these agents is also weight loss, uh, which uh, can be uh, a very enticing aspect uh, for many of our patients. Is the weight loss more than metformin? Uh, yes, metformin tends to be more or less weight neutral depending on which study you look at. Uh, but the metformin, yeah, it is, uh, well, they've compared it to placebo, but yes, I would expect more uh, weight loss with SGLT2 inhibitors over metformin. So in what uh, type two diabetic patients you would never consider these drugs? It sounds to me like uh, most should be on them, so maybe it's easier to think who should never be on them. Right. So, uh, as 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 you as you well very well highlighted that these are newer agents, so uh, these agents also come with a certain cost uh, that goes with it. So uh, that is often a factor that we would want to consider in our um, uh, in our assess in our prescription assessment. Uh, Patients who may not uh, have to necessarily, who are not overweight uh, or obese, uh, they may be lesser of a suitable candidate, uh, in my opinion. Um, 
yeah, I think these would be some of the candidates that uh, be it could be lower on the your recommendation list. So if you were to give it to someone, uh, what's, ca what's the recommended follow-up? Should they come back in two weeks, get their uh, creatinine <coughs> checked, get their urine, make sure there's no UTI? What, what, what do you think we should do with these? Yeah, and uh, this would depend on who, uh, who do you ask. Um, uh, among endocrinologists ourselves, uh, there is a quite of a variable practice. Uh, in many cases, yes, uh, I try to have a follow-up uh, comprehensive metabolic panel checked in a couple of weeks just to make sure that they're not having any uh, the euglycemic acidosis develop, uh, which oftentimes uh, may happen in the setting of uh, a, a precipitating illness or a stressor. Uh, in the hospital setting, we often see euglycemic decay come in uh, following surgeries when the patients were continued up until the day before their, these medications were continued up until the day before the surgery. And hence the more current recommendation that these medications be held for four days prior to an elective procedure. Um, uh, but yes, uh, and otherwise it's a symptomatic uh, question history on their follow-up visits, whether if they've had any uh, urinary tract infections, any yeast infections, that's a part of um, their, uh, their uh, assessment uh, on their follow-up visits so yeah is, is that, one other is, aspect go ahead sorry yeah one other aspect that i would like to highlight uh, since we are a uh, your cardiology and nephrology audience as well uh, that oftentimes uh, when we start sglt2 inhibitors and if somebody is already on a diuretic uh, a dose reduction of the diuretic may be and required in such instances because the glucoeuretic, uh, there is a chance for dehydration. So there might be a chance that, that they may need a lower diuretic dose if they're already on it. So, you know, they've been shown to reduce progression of kidney disease. They reduce, reduce hospitalization, macrovascular event, microvascular event. Is this a class effect or do you, uh, do you treat these agents interchangeably if one insurance company doesn't pay for one, the other is as good or? Yes, for the most part. Uh, so that's, that's, the, uh, that's the nice part about uh, this class of medications that yes, we are seeing this benefit across uh, several of these agents. Mm. And so the hospitalization for heart failure data has been very impressive uh, across the board reduction. <laughs> Uh, so very, very superlative in that regard. So, yeah, we often interchange. Uh, we are often at the mercy of uh, insurance formulary changes, usually at the first of the year, and then you have to flip back from EMPA to DAPA to CANA and whatnot. So, yeah, I use them very interchangeably. What would you say your favorite? Uh, any one of the above that's covered <laughs> and, or that they can afford. <laughs> uh, the cheapest one. How expensive are they? What's the average copay on these drugs? Oh, it varies. I think with uh, commercial insurances, uh, we might run into lesser of an issue, even if they're not covered. Many of these pharmaceutical companies, they have uh, copay uh, coupons that we often encourage patients to sign up for. Uh, if they're in Medicare, uh, there we may run into some of the challenges uh, because some of the individuals might run into the donut hole and the cost of the medication might really skyrocket. Uh, what uh, I often also use is uh, for some patients who may qualify our patient assistance programs through these pharmaceutical companies that may, and if they do qualify, then it offsets the cost of the medication considerably. You know, I just, uh, I just saw a paper in circulation, Dr. Guha, you might be interested in this uh, group looked at people with high right-sided pressures and actually SGL2-2 inhibitors within a week reduces right-sided pressure and their benefits are sustained. And we actually have a patient now that we're considering this uh, and it'll be interesting to see how they do. Thank you so much. This is, uh, I guess it should be in the water of uh, anybody <laughs> uh, with diabetes. Uh, I think cardiovascular disease certainly is what we struggle with and I think uh, Angelina Edwards uh, have written this beautiful uh, editorial and assessment uh, about why this condition is so common uh, and how do, should we test people who need a transplant 
uh, to assess their candidacy. So, Dr. Edwards, wh why is cardiovascular disease so common uh, in kidney disease? Yeah, no, it's it's definitely that friend and foe phenomenon that we observe. Um, you know, I think a lot of our patients with renal disease carry with them the traditional risk factors for cardiovascular disease. So uh, age, diabetes, dyslipidemia, tobacco use, uh, physical inactivity, but then definitely there are those renal specific risk factors uh, that can really lead to accelerated atherosclerosis. Uh, some of that is just the uremic milieu and the oxidative stress that accompanies that along with inflammation also unique to our kidney patients is the bone mineral metabolism abnormalities and dysregulation that can often contribute to extra osseous vascular calcifications. So those can really impact and uh, the, the overall uh, risk factors for CVD. Um, also, uh, for many of our ESRD patients, uh, they do have challenges with chronic hypervolemia. Um, and so the impact of that on left ventricular hypertrophy, left ventricular remodeling, as well as pulmonary hypertension. Um, so those all play into uh, that high incidence of cardiovascular disease that we, uh, that we observe amongst our, our kidney population. And are there strategies such as hypertension control, lipid control, that so beneficial in the general population? Are they of help at all in this population? They can be, absolutely. Um, you know, particularly in our kidney transplant patients, uh, we know that there's good evidence to support the use of statin therapy, um, definitely to optimize uh, uh, their cholesterol panel. Um, most of our kidney transplant patients are encouraged to be on a lipid lowering agent. Um, and that's mainly coming from good evidence, uh, specifically the ALERT trial, which was the assessment of less call in renal transplantation. It's the only randomized trial in kidney transplant recipients that looked at statin therapy. And it showed a 35% reduction in cardiac deaths in those that were treated with flubostatin. And there was an extension trial that showed a 21% reduction in cardiac events. Um, so definitely there is a role for statin therapy in our kidney transplant population. What about the end stage patient that is on dialysis or near dialysis? Uh, is that a group where number one, uh, statins provide any benefit, and number two, even hypertensive drugs, because they have these big swings when they go to dialysis, and, and we're often challenged in trying to decide how much uh, benefit they're going to get to trying to push the blood pressure down. So tell us a little bit about that group, because that's one that gives us, uh, I think, both the nephrologists and the cardiologists some headaches. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. It's a great point. You know, I think um, definitely our, our approach to optimal medical therapy is is changing and evolving and and much of that is based on uh, recent studies uh, that f assessed uh, some of these interventions in CKD and ESRD patients. Uh, so as you all are familiar with most likely the ischemia CKD trial, which was the international study of comparative health effectiveness with medical and invasive approaches, um, really looked uh, very carefully at patients with advanced kidney disease, EGFR less than 30 or dialysis dependence and randomize those to uh, whether they should have an invasive uh, strategy with revascularization, coronary angiogram, or optimal medical therapy. And really it showed uh, that in those that had um, the invasive strategy, there was no uh, significant cardioprotective benefit. The true benefit was derived from those that were maintained on optimal medical therapy. And that included statins, that included uh, uh, medications for blood pressure, specifically cardioprotective ones, as we know, which are the angiotensin uh, receptor blockers. Um, unfortunately, these are underutilized. And I think we as nephrologists uh, need to carry uh, the, the banner in making sure that our patients are on these uh, therapies that, that are proven beneficial. 
Um, in terms of a uh, ESRD patient that's on dialysis that is not on a statin and does not have a, a strong indication for it, our current KDGO guidelines do not support the use or, or initiation of a statin. But as you all know, the majority of our patients are coming to us already with those traditional risk factors and already with a high uh, incidence of cardiovascular disease. So I think it behooves us to make sure that they are on that therapy. Thank you, Dr. Edwards. And you. Well, we're, time, time flies while you're having fun, so we, we are pretty much uh, at the end of the hour. We want to really thank all of you. This has been a wonderful educating, ed, educa education for all of us. Um, just to remind you to do go to the journal and uh, find us there and read the articles, and there are a few others that we won't, didn't have time to, uh, to uh, be able to discuss. And um, with that, we will tell you to good night, enjoy a good evening, and a good dinner. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.